I'm going to tell you the story of how a company lost $2 billion in today's money because they didn't listen to their customers. It's the mid-1950s and one of the most famous car companies in the world is no longer owned solely by the founding family. Now a publicly traded company, it also found itself with a brand new management group which began looking at the market afresh. The company was Ford Motor Company. Ford also owned the Mercury and Lincoln car brands, with the thinking at the time that as a person developed through their career, they would also move up the ladder when it came to cars. So they would move from Ford to Mercury to Lincoln Income. The problem, however, was that this wasn't happening, and it was far more likely for them to go from Ford to General Motors Oldsmobile. General Motors had a large number of car brands, and they were easy stepping stones between each of these brands. Ford Executive Vice President Ernest R. Breach had noticed this and had convinced the management that there was an opportunity to build a new brand for the growing middle class. At the time, Pontiac, Buick, and Dodge had sold over 2 million units, all competing in the middle range market. It seemed logical, therefore, that if a new Ford brand could be created that sat in the space in between Ford and Mercury, there would be plenty of opportunity to sell the new brand. The project was given the go-ahead under the codename eCar, and it's from here that things begin to change. We may never know all the reasons for the car's failure, but it is clear that there were a number of problems that altered the course of the project's promising start. The first of these was the naming. The naming of the brand was somewhat controversial. Ford commissioned Foot, Cone and Belding to come up with a name for the division, but none stuck, reportedly providing over 6,000 options. Unofficially, poet Marianne Moore was also asked to come up with some names, but in the end, it was under the instruction of Ernest Breach that it be called Edsall, in honour of Edsall Ford. This was despite Henry Ford II not being present at the board meeting and knowingly unhappy with using his father's name. In 1958, Ford released this statement. The Edsall is new, but it's actually the germination of an idea conceived by Edsall Ford, who thought years ago that the company should have greater representation in the medium-priced range. This idea was furthered by his son, Henry Ford II, in 1948, when another car was proposed to keep abreast of things in the automotive market. But the fact was, the design was never tested with customers. It was conjured up by the committee, with the car's original design being very different from what was finally sold. Again, the committee, or in this case, Ernest Breach, demanded the front grille should be taller and wider. And while there were innovative parts on the car, the car itself was disjointed in its design and aesthetic. With no Edsall factory, the cars were built in either an existing Mercury or Ford production line, built from a mix of existing Ford, Mercury, and new parts, which meant during the car's assembly, workers had to use different tools to install some parts distinct from the mainstream Ford and Mercury models. And apparently it became commonplace for dealers to receive unfinished Edsalls with the disparate parts chucked in the trunk. By 1957, the US economy was not as healthy as when Edsall was being planned. This lack of free cash hit the motor industries hard with many keeping to what they already had, riding out the tide until things got better. If we think back to the main reason for Edsall to exist, it was to be that stepping stone from Ford to Mercury. The problem was, is that the car itself had become far more expensive to design and build than planned, and in the end was only a few dollars different from Ford's existing Mercury range. And in some cases, they were even more expensive than the Mercury. Finally, one can't forget that at the time, the competition weren't standing still. In particular, Chrysler, who through the design of Virgil Exner, had radically changed the entire lineup in a new and exciting aircraft-inspired direction. By 1957, Plymouth, Dodge, DeSoto, and Chrysler tail fins, roof lines, and overall proportions were the envy of the industry. So when customers were comparing the homely Edsall, it already felt old before it even left the forecourt. So what can we learn from this story? Let your customers try out your product. If you are going to conduct customer research, act on it and don't think you know better. Constantly reevaluate why you are doing what you're doing. Is the opportunity still there? Use personas to help you make decisions rather than thinking that you know best. I hope you enjoyed the fable today. Do give us a like and let us know what you thought in the comments. Do consider subscribing. We post videos every week about branding, design, design thinking, and digital. Thanks again for watching and see you in the next one.